Good morning, folks. It's Diamond with the Oppenheimer Ranch Project, Magnetic Reversal News, and Shinrin Yoku, bringing you a grand solar minimum update, Saturday, September 10th, around 1 p.m. Mountain Time, 2022. We're looking at the Tyrannus Fracture Zone as the seismic crisis continues without abatement, and many people are getting concerned for a larger quake in that region. We will also have a La Nina update, so stick with us. Summer snow, U.S. town gets winter preview weeks before fall begins. We reported on this yesterday, and snow fell across parts of Wyoming late Thursday night to Friday morning, the first snow of the season for Wyoming. And it wasn't just a few flurries. The road at Powder River Pass in northern Wyoming was almost completely covered by accumulating snow. And that's about uh, 9,000 feet or so. Ho, ho, ho. San Diego County sees record-breaking rainfall from Tropical Storm K. Keep calm. It's tropics time. Now, let's take a look at some of the... San Diego wasn't the only place to break, break records. In fact, a lot of this rain fell in areas that just never gets rain. So, record-breaking rainfall is easy if any rain falls. San Diego set a new daily precipitation record of over a half an inch, beating the old record of less than a tenth of an inch back in 1976. Escondido saw 0.16 inches of rain, beating a trace of rain back in 72. Vista beat its old record of zero with 0.37 inches. And you can look at this. Lake Cuyamaca saw a whopping 1.96 inches of rain Friday, breaking the old record of just 0.37 in 1975 and so on and so forth. So lots of records being broken thanks to Hurricane K in very parched in much needed areas. As Atlantic hurricane season reaches climatological peak now as I am speaking. Welcome back to America's Weather Weekend. It's time to check in on the tropics as we get into the climatological peak of hurricane season today for the Atlantic. Uh, we take a look at Earl. Remember that TV show, My Name is Earl? It was about uh, karma. I think that was Jason Lee, actor Jason Lee, who played that. He won the lottery in the beginning of the show, then he oh, was hit yeah. by a car. The whole series was all about good karma. Earl was a good guy. So was her Hurricane Earl. <laughs> good guy, right? Um, starting to move away, leaving. Uh, now I'm going into pop culture craziness because I remember goodbye Earl too that was the chicks right uh, goodbye Earl wow does she even report any of the weather that is insane we'll get into a more detailed look at Earl now Earl is sitting right off the coast there of Newfoundland with sustained winds at 90 miles per hour and it is headed over to wreak havoc on uh, Norway Scandinavia and Europe and that includes you, the UK, so heads up. Earl is headed your way. Let's talk about the triple dip La Nina, which is on the way, and what it means for weather in the U.S. I'm sure you're interested. La Nina winter 2022-23 could mean tornado outbreaks, blizzards, and everything in between. Now, do you remember, let's say, two winters ago? Well, if forecasts for a rare triple dip La Nina are accurate, the country is in store for more weather extremes, according to NOAA and their newly released updated outlook, which we're looking at here, <laughs> on Thursday, said that there was a 91% chance the pattern would be in control through November and a 54% chance through March of 2023. Now, a substantial amount of cooler than average water in the eastern central Pacific and long range climate models give forecasters confidence that the La Nina pattern will continue. Now, during a typical La Nina winter, especially, the southern tier of the country tends to be drier and warmer, and the northern half is usually colder and snowier than usual. And here you can see that on the map. Where moisture and temperature extremes meet, areas can resemble battle zones. If the right ingredients are in place, tornado outbreaks can impact the south and the country's heartland in winter. Preliminary research indicates that La Nina corresponds to an especially active phase for tornadoes over the Deep South with a relatively high frequency of cold season outbreaks of EF2 or stronger tornadoes. And that's according to the National Weather Service office in Jackson, Mississippi. Now, the combination of an active jet stream, plenty of moisture, and a clash of air masses, and then we couple the magnetosphere weakening, the weakening sun, and the meridional flow this all helped to produce the record-breaking deadly tornado outbreak in December of 2021. And the outbreak included a rare EF4 long-track tornado that flattened parts of Mayfield, Kentucky. 
On the other side of the spectrum, snowstorms and blizzards are usually common where deep moisture meets frigid air. Communities from Maine through the Plains and the Pacific Northwest reported record-breaking snowfall events during the past winter. And there is nothing in the outlook that says the extreme events won't happen again in the northern tier, and perhaps even more extreme. Now, according to NOAA's Climate Prediction Center, they believe La Nina 3 Pete will only be the third time on record for the occurrence. Usually, the El Nino Southern Oscillation, or what is commonly called ENSO, tends to act more like a seesaw, flipping between La Nina and El Nino more frequently. Um, and these three peats are actually quite rare. But long-term model guidance shows very high chances of La Nina drastically waning during the spring. So this would be the end of the three peat here. You can see the probability of La Nina in the blue graphs. And here, these are the months of the season. We're sitting over here, August, September, October. The end, and we're in September, obviously, so we have a high La Nina. And then this is the forecast moving forward as we go into the winter. Now, the winter ends somewhere right around here, and it is the highest probability to stay in La Nina through the end of winter. So this could be another winter to remember with record-breaking uh snowfall uh, and extreme events like EF4 tornadoes. So heads up. Now, here's the forecast. Heavy rain and flooding in the southwest and southeast. Moisture from rapidly weakening K will continue to produce heavy rain and flooding in the southwest. Heavy rain and flood potential also in the southeast into the mid-Atlantic and in the south central and southeast Alaska. Strong offshore winds will produce critical fire weather conditions in the Pacific Northwest. As Earl swells continue to bring dangerous surf and rip currents to the east, especially up there in Canada, eastern Canada. So heads up if you're there. Take a look at the flash flood warnings here. These are the remnants of K, and we've got high winds up in the Pacific Northwest. So click on your county for more info. Now let's take, the, take a look at the total precipitated moisture. Now, through the afternoon, you can see the biggest chance, and through Monday morning, the rest of the weekend, the biggest chance of flooding is in Wisconsin and Michigan as the system moves through there. But the Four Corners in Southern California, as well as Southern Nevada, those are the remnants, remnant moisture of K, New Mexico, could see some heavy rain events, as well as flash flooding. While some of the driest areas in the U.S., well, seem to be doing just fine with precipitation. Only left out is Western Oregon and Northern California. So, the desert... Southwest is going to be picking up moisture for several weeks to come. As the worst drought in living memory threatens the world's olive oil supply. Now, good news. These tropical systems in the Atlantic that are missing the East Coast are all heading towards Europe, where they've been suffering from drought. And I sound like a broken record. The rain is coming. It already started. And no one's bumming that the worst drought in living memory will soon come to an end in Spain. So... That is the beauty of it. And let's take a look at the GFS model. This is just out the next four days. Most of Spain is going to, most all, the entire country of Spain is predicted to get rain, heavy rain in four sections. And if we just move it through, there could be some epic rain, six inches of rain in some places, including Portugal through the next week. And it continues to rain in Spain, in the plain. Is it mainly in the plain? Seismic update. Boom! Most recent quake, Atu Station, Alaska. There have been a series of large rumblers, 6.2 near the surface in Papua New Guinea, Indonesia. No, that's Papua, Indonesia. Papua New Guinea is in New Anyway. So, you would think that there would be a lot of death and destruction here, but this was absolutely in the middle of the jungle, the middle of nowhere. So, a few huts maybe got rattled, as far as I could tell. Back to the Chernus Fracture Zone here in northern Iceland where we can see the seismic crisis has now entered its third day, and it's really showing no signs of stopping whatsoever. Now, frequently when this occurs in this area, a large seismic event happens at the same time nearby. So that's what we're waiting for. We're also waiting for potentially a subsurface volcanic event to be getting started. Now, according to the Iceland Met Office, and this is the update for today, the seismic swarm that began on the 8th of September east of Grimsey, has now recorded over 3,200 earthquakes. That's amazing. With the largest detected as a 4.9 on the 8th of September. Now, there have been some large quakes, just another 4.6 occurring just recently, and a 4.2 and a 4.1. So that, those are the facts on what's happening in Iceland 
as we keep an eye on that worldwide volcano news update. All is normal with the around 25 vol uh, erupting volcanoes worldwide, except a new one has been added to the list, a laid volcano. And uh, we need to bring this to your attention because there have been no events in Allade for several years and now explosive activity occurring to 10,000 feet. Now, this volcano is a cinder cone that is, or a strato volcano in the form of a cinder cone that is very explosive. And here's an old timey picture of it blown up. Because back in 1981, there was a confirmed VEI 4, and back in 1790 as well. So, this is no joke. And there have been 16 Holocene eruptive events. Now, luckily, it's in the middle of nowhere here on the tip of Kamchatka, but it is in the Northern Hemisphere. So, it could be a boom. Space weather news update. All is quiet on the sun. The visible disk on Saturday has seven numbered sunspot regions with a possible eighth forming. Yes in the northwest qu quadrant. Solar activity during the past 24 hours is low with only minor sea flares. None of the visible active regions are uh, currently considered a strong threat for noteworthy solar flares. And the old region 3088 is still around the backside. And that created that super big blast that made the sun vibrate in a weird way. That will be turning around the limb in just about two days. So we could be getting snappy. In just a couple evenings. Now here, take a look at extraordinary clouds caught water falling over the rock of Gibraltar. Say it ain't snow. No, no, it's clouds. Just a cool jiffy. A banner cloud on the rock of Gibraltar. Now this was on the morning of August 24th. A breezy late summer wind carried a cascade of clouds over the rock of Gibraltar. The windy waterfall captivated onlookers and a view from the airport was filmed and shared as a time lapse. And let's get that in higher resolution. This is not CGI, folks. Pretty glorious. All the links to everything we show you will be below the video, so go check it out. Now, dramatic rise in cancer in people under 50. Altered microbiome, sleep deprivation. Increase in alcohol consumption among the possible culprits in 30-year global trend. You are what you eat. You fix your gut. You fix your health. And some of the food in the supermarket isn't even food for sheep. It's toxic. It's banned in many countries. And families continue to buy it and consume it. Try to switch your diet to a more raw food aspect where you're eating actual whole foods. Eat organically, grow your own food, and don't die of cancer. Now some science. Continental plate movement controlled Earth's largest volcanic events. New hypothesis based on data is coming out. New research suggests that the slowing of continental plate movement is the critical event that enables deep magma to rise to the Earth's surface for long periods of time and then obviously delivered devastating impacts. Now, major volcanic events occurred millions of years ago that caused such climatic and biological upheaval that they drove some of the most devastating extinction events. The one studied here was back 183 million years ago in the Torsian period. Now, the research team discovered that this time period, which was characterized by some of the most severe climatic and environmental changes ever, directly coincided with the occurrence of major volcanic activity. And scientists have long thought that the onset of upwelling of, of molten volcanic rock or magma from deep in the Earth's interior as mantle plumes was the instigator of such volcanic activity. But the new evidence shows that the normal rate of continental plate movement of several centimeters per year effectively prevents magma from just penetrating the Earth's crust and coming up. And it seems, based on this study, that it's only when the speed of the continental plate movement slows down to near zero that the magmas from mantle plumes can effectively crack their way to the surface, causing major large igneous provinces, volcanic eruptions, and their associated climatic mass extinctions. So, if the Earth's rotation, say, were to stop, 
that might affect the plates as well and allow this to happen. So interesting study coming out from Trinity College, Dublin. Mystery 4,000 foot coral reef found in the middle of the desert. Well, holy macaroni. That means sea level was much, much higher. And in fact, it was. In the southern Australia's Nullarbor Plain, the reef was found is now a 76,000 square mile desert consisting of limestone bedrock. But it was once considered a tropical ocean about 14 million years ago. So interesting study. If you want to learn more, click the link below and make it so. Now, 1.8 million year old tooth of an early human has been found on a dig in Georgia. And no, not in the United States in the state of, but the country, Georgia. <laughs> so archaeologists in Georgia have found a 1.8 million year old tooth belonging to an early species of human that they say cements the region as the home of one of the earliest prehistoric human settlements in Europe and possibly anywhere outside Africa. Let's get a look. That tooth. Holy macaroni. That's fantastic. Looks like it has a filling. Now, you know man, bear, pig. That's Al Gore. But did you actually know that man, bear, pig was an animal? And living fast may have helped mammals like man, bear, pig dominate. In fact, man, bear, pig is so unique in the sense that the babies were gestated for very long periods of time and were born very mature. And then they aged rapidly to adulthood. It's like a super aging animal, man, bear, pig. And they were huge. The ancient mammal, Pantolambda bathmodon, looked something like a jumbo red panda with a bear-like head, a stocky build, and a long tail. Despite its fearsome appearance, P. bathmodon was a gentle plant-eating giant in its ecosystem. And that, that's man bear pig. That's interesting. So read the article. Man bear pig was around 60 around the earth 66 million years ago when we see this huge explosion in mammal diversity where mammals start to get really big because the dinosaurs went bye-bye. And one of the first was man bear pig. Of course, he was a vegan. Now, there's a surprising strong link between altitude and suicide in the U.S., and it's startling. Over the past two decades, researchers have observed that people living at higher altitudes have an increased risk for suicide. Now, for every increase of 100 meters, suicide rates by, rises by 0.4% per 100,000. Now, one explanation is that lower oxygen levels in the air interfere with brain activity. But the reason I live so high above sea level, at 7,000 feet, is that on the whole, living at high altitudes reduces all-cause mortality. Some of the oldest people are living up here. And the reduction in cardiovascular disease and cancer living at altitude outweighs suicide risks overall. So, interesting study in case you were wondering why you wanted to kill yourself. Please don't do that. Call a suicide prevention line. Now, as we finish up here, you can grow it. Or you don't even have to if you're lazy. There are five common weeds that you can eat and this article covers all the ones you could find everywhere. Well, many of us grow vegetables in our gardens, but even if you don't, you just might have a whole produce section growing in your yard that you don't even know about. And that's because many of the plants we think of as weeds are actually wild greens that are edible. Today on You Can Grow It, Garden Master Jim Duthie shows us five common edible weeds that are probably growing in your yard. And he says, that they can be just as delicious and nutritious as the produce you buy in the supermarket. And they just may save Most your ass. We spend a lot of time and money trying to get rid of weeds that pop up in our lawns and gardens. And while many of them can be annoying and invasive, some of them are actually edible, not just for survival, but as delicious, nutritious greens for our dinner table. Here are five common edible weeds that you probably have growing in your backyard. Common broadleaf plantain is a perennial plant that grows from spring to autumn. The entire plant is edible, especially the young leaves that can be eaten raw or cooked. Many people blanch the leaves in boiling water to make them more tender and then use them in salads and soups. Dried leaves make a healthy herbal tea. Plantain is rich in vitamin B1 and riboflavin. Another common garden weed is common mallow. 
It's the same family as okra, and all parts of the plant are edible. The leaves can be added to a salad, as well as the flowers. When cooked, the leaves secrete a thick liquid similar to okra that can be used to thicken soups and stews, and even beaten into a meringue-like substitute for egg whites. The flavor of the leaves is quite mild. Dried mallow leaves can be used for tea. You can easily find purslane growing along the edge of the garden or the flower bed, and even along the sidewalk or driveway. Purslane leaves are plump and succulent, and the plant can be eaten as a cooked vegetable, or in soups and stews, or raw in salads. The leaves are high in omega-3 fatty acids, as well as many vitamins and minerals that strengthen the immune system. All parts of the plant are edible, including the stems and flower buds. Oxalis, or wood sorrel, sprouts up in lawns and flower beds and resembles clover or shamrocks. Sometimes the leaves take on a bronze tint. Oxalis literally means sour, since it contains oxalic acid, giving it a mild sour taste similar to lemons. In fact, while the leaves are edible raw, they can be chopped into water with sugar to make a lemonade-like drink. The plant is high in vitamin C. It's an incredible thirst quencher and is refreshing to eat, and dried leaves can be sprinkled on food as a seasoning. Finally, dandelions grow in almost every lawn and garden, and they're more nutritious than many of the fruits and vegetables we buy in the grocery store. The entire plant is edible, including the leaves, the roots, and the flowers. Leaves can be added to a salad or cooked. Flowers can be made into juice, and the root can be roasted and made into a coffee substitute. Young leaves, or those picked from shady areas, are less likely to have a bitter taste. Dandelions are a rich source of vitamins A, B, C, E, and K, as well as many essential minerals, especially potassium. And there's as much calcium in a handful of dandelion greens as there is in half a cup of milk. If you do decide to harvest some edible weeds to eat, make sure that you know what you're picking. Many wild plants are not edible and some... There you go, that could save your butt. And make sure you don't pick these wild edibles where they're spraying pesticides. Know where you're wild harvesting. Wild harvesting can save you. Wild harvesting can keep you healthy when things are out of your price range. So go out into the woods and go wild harvest. And that's a boom. Hope you got something out of the video. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't. Share this with like-minded people and be safe. We love you. Become a hero. Share the video.